So today I am excited to talk about the third edition of Test App. So I'm going to start by talking a little bit about like, what do I mean by that? You, you certainly all know what a version of a package is, but what do I mean by this being the third edition of Test App? And I'm going to talk through kind of three big new features in this, in this version, in this edition, uh, see how we test that now displays differences much more clearly using the Waldo package. We'll talk about a new type of testing, new type of testing to test that called snapshot tests. Very briefly talk about testing in parallel, multi-process testing. And then finally, I'm gonna give you a real quick goodie bag of a bunch of little small stuff that will hopefully make your life a little bit easier when using test that. So the, the big news with this release of test, at least the upcoming release, test that 3.0, is we're going to introduce the idea of this third edition. And I should say any anything you're going to hear about today uh, is also explained in more detail in vignettes on the test that website. So if you want to learn more about anything I say today, feel free to take a look at those vignettes. And if they don't explain, they, they don't help you understand what's going on, please file an issue so we can make them better. So the basic idea of the, the addition is that we want to make breaking changes to test that. Test that's like 10 years old or something. And you know, there's a there's a bunch of things in the package that we now regret. But uh, test that's kind of a victim of its own popularity. There's you know something like four or five thousand packages on CRAN that use test that, and many of them are not actively developed. So there's no way we can change test that without breaking a bunch of packages. And many of these packages, since they wouldn't be maintained, there's no one, people would they'll just end up off CRAN because people wouldn't have the energy to to um, fix them. So the idea of an addition is that this is something you have to deliberately opt into. So if you want to use many of the new features or all of the new features of test that I talk about today, you have to deliberately choose to use a third edition of test that. And so to do that, you basically have to add a line in your description file, config slash test that slash edition. So if you don't do this, you'll continue to use this, the second edition, that's the existing behavior of test that. If you do this, you'll get, if you do change this, you'll get a bunch of um, new features and a bunch of things, which I'll explain shortly, which have, which have gone away. So the kind of idea is that um, it should take, hopefully, you know, less than 30 minutes to convert a package to use the third edition. You know, it's a little bit of work, hopefully not too much work, but it just generally gets you up to date with all of our best current best practices. And I should say, if this kind of idea of this addition idea is successful, it's something we're likely to try out in other packages, a way of allowing existing code to continue working while giving you the choice to opt in to a new set of behaviors. So additions will always be coupled with a major version. So that means test that two and everything else before it this counts as the second edition, test that 3.0 can use the second edition that's the default behavior or you can opt into using the third edition and if one day you know many probably multiple years down the line we decide to introduce a fourth edition then that would be tied to test at 4.0 so what's going away in the third edition um, these are the things that are most likely to lead you to, to change your tests while the context function is going away we've kind of been moving away from this for quite some time um, in favor of just using the name of the test file. There's no need to kind of duplicate the information in the test file in another function, which you have to remember to update if you ever move your test files. We've also been uh, lately in DevTools and used this building kind of a stronger coupling between files in the R directory and files in the test directory so that there's a, there's a kind of a one-to-one -one correspondence, which gives you a bunch of handy keyboard shortcuts and development tools. Uh, the very old expect that function is going away. This was the kind of first API, uh, the first excessively clever API that uh, test that used where every test kind of had the flavor. You could read it like a sentence, like test that blah is true. Uh, and I pretty quickly discovered, decided that that was um, excessively clever, not very good. And so we, we're finally deprecating that for good. Expect is, um, 
we're deprecating in favor of expect um, S3 class, expect S4 class, and expect type of just to be more precise about what exactly you're trying to express. Uh, expect equivalent, I'll talk about a little bit later, but we're basically, that's just giving an argument to expect equal or expect identical. Uh, some of the, the mocking functions going away in favor of more featureful packages. And then finally, we are moving away from setup and tear down in favor of uh, test fixtures, which I'm not going to talk about today, but there's a whole vignette about them if you want to learn more. And hopefully that's kind of all I need to say, just these are the functions that are going away. Uh, like if you really, really believe any of these functions are important, like now's the time to speak up and say you want to keep these. Otherwise, when you switch to the second, switch to the third edition, rerun all your tests, you'll get deprecation messages telling you what to replace these functions with. So that's kind of the stuff that's going away. Now I want to focus on the cool new features. And I think the feature you are most likely to encounter and the most likely to give you pleasure in your life is that comparisons with expect equal and expect identical or test failures with expect error, equal and expect identical are now much easier to uh, understand. So previously, expect equal uses the base all.equal function. This was never really what all.equal was intended for, but it kind of did an okay job. But there's a few cases where it just doesn't give very useful output. And so here I'm comparing empty cars without the first column to empty cars, the, the full data set. And you'll notice I get a lot of output. Well, it tells me that there's 10 string mismatches in the names. It doesn't really help me. It tells me there's a length mismatch. And then it gives me a bunch of mean relative differences. So this certainly tells me that there's a difference, but it doesn't kind of concisely crisply point me to the fact there's a column missing in this data frame. So now we use Waldo. Um, so to use this, I'm just going to use this function called local addition. This is not something you generally need to use in your tests because you'll convert a whole package to use a third edition. But we provide this local addition function for you know, writing stuff like this, for writing vignettes so we can explain about this new edition. This just temporarily sets the addition to the third edition. So now um, use the third edition. And now this is the new Waldo output. So the kind of the first principle is that Waldo is going to give you the most important differences first. And in this case, I think the most important difference is that the length are different. And then it tells us what the names are, how the names have changed, lining up the old names, lining up, sorry, the, the actual names with the expected names. And then it uses color to highlight the fact that in the expected, there's another column called MPG. And then finally down here, we get an exact description that, well, the names are different, but the values are also different. Uh, the actual, it's absent. And as I read this, that is clearly not the case because it's absent from the expected. So I think I've, I've messed up the labels here. So I'll have to fix these. This should say uh, expected MPG is absent. And this should say actual MPG is a double vector. Um, so that just allows you, once I fix those labels, to precisely see what the differences are. So here we've switched to use the third edition. Waldo then shows the most differences, important differences first. It uses color to help hi and it uses color to help highlight differences. Oh, and it always uses the names of things where possible, just because that makes it easier to understand exactly where the differences lie. So another ex little example here, I have a factor uh, versus an ordered factor with uh, one extra level. When you look at the expect equal output from the second edition, you'll see like it kind of tells you that they're different, but it's hard because it doesn't include the values to know exactly what's changed. When we switch to the third edition, now we can see, well, there's a new element of the class vector, it's ordered, and there's a new element of the levels, which is D. And hopefully this will make it much, much easier to see exactly what's gone wrong. And certainly in my own, this is like, this is the number one reason I've been converting packages to use the third edition to test that, just because it makes things so much easier to see uh, when something's gone wrong. So if you want to learn more about Waldo, you can go to the Waldo website. 
uh, which shows a bunch of kind of examples, shows some of the, the principles. Uh, a lot of the, the differences of the values are powered by this really nice uh, package called diffobj uh, by Brody Graslam, which uses the same algorithm as the diff utility on Linux, which just makes it really easy to kind of narrow and exactly what has changed between two vectors. This change also makes it now possibly precise about what's the difference between expect equal, expect identical, and expect equivalent, which are always a little vague in the past. Now, all of these functions are equivalent to expect identical, but with some extra arguments set. So if you use expect equal, that's equivalent to expect identical, except that it ignores small floating point differences. Or if you use expect equivalent, which is now deprecated, it's just the same as using expect equal or expect equivalent with ignore attribute equals true. That's the only thing that expect equivalent does is it just ignores attributes. Now we're gonna make that precise in a function argument. And then any other arguments and expect identical or expect equal are passed on to Waldo compare, which gives you the ability to kind of fine tune your comparisons uh, as needed. Now, this is such a great idea. You might wonder, well, why can't it just, why can't it work for the second edition as well? Well, unfortunately, when I implemented expect equal, it, Turns out that I made uh, made a rather silly mistake when implementing the tolerance uh, comparison. So depending on exactly which code path that goes down, it computes the tolerance in slightly different ways. One way it always uses the absolute tolerance and one way it uses absolute or relative tolerance. So there's basically no way, I did a few experiments, there's no way regardless of which one I pick, it causes like hundreds of PRAN packages to break. So that, that that's the, the main reason that this has to be in the third edition. Uh, but there's a few other small things, particularly if you're testing code in a modeling package, uh, all.equal, which used to power expect equal, ignores environments of formulas and models, uh, sorry, formulas and, uh, functions. Uh, Waldo does not, but it provides a couple of arguments to um, allow you to override that if you need to. And there's just a few other small things around like POSIX CT. So I think the behavior of Waldo is generally better. It's a little bit stricter and when it fails, it'll give you clearer results, but we can't just turn it on for everyone because it would break a bunch of tests. So you're going to have to deliberately opt into it. Okay, so that's Waldo. I think that's like kind of number one feature. Uh, like, again, I have found it like so useful when debugging tests myself to have that much, much, much clearer display. The next big feature I want to talk about is snapshot testing. Uh, again, this comes with a vignette. So if you want to learn more about it, you can read the vignette. If the vignette doesn't make sense, please file an issue so we can make it better. But the basic idea is. This is a slight, this is a new type of testing. So normally in unit tests, you describe the expected output using code. And in the vast majority of cases, this is a really, really good idea because it allows you to kind of describe what you expect. And in some sense, the tests help document, you know, because the tests are code and code is a, a, a means of communication, they, they kind of help describe the expected behavior of the functions as well. But sometimes describing the expected output is just like really annoying. Like if it contains a bunch of special characters like quotes or backslashes, you have to spend a bunch of time like carefully escaping them. And then when something goes wrong, it's hard to see exactly like you've got to unescape them in your head and it's just a pain. Or maybe it's very large, like maybe you want to check an entire HTML page or multiple paragraphs of text uh, as you expect. Or maybe it's it's not even something that you can easily describe with text. It's an image or something else. So the idea of a snapshot or golden tests, which is an idea um, used in other programming languages and other testing um, packages. Um, and and uh, test that inspiration draws primarily from Jest, which is a JavaScript testing package that uh, Joe Cheng uh, shared his experiences with me a bunch and persuaded me that this was something really useful. But so the snapshot test, the key idea is that instead of recording the results in line and the test itself, they're stored in a separate file. And test that provides a bunch of tools for um, 
looking after that, from managing that file. So it will create it automatically the first time you run it, and then it gives you tools to update it when you decide there really has been a change. And if you've used uh, verify output or expect known output, which we've never really advertised because we've never really been particularly happy with them, uh, the snapshot tests basically supersede those functions. So what does a snapshot, snapshot test look like? Look like. So here I'm just going to give you a quick simulation in uh, the presentation and I'll show you what this looks like in a real package. So here I've got two files, foo.r. Uh, I've just got this very silly and simple function which has a mistake in it, you can see, which we'll fix shortly. And then I've got a test. Uh, so I run foo, I expect it as a character vector, and then I'm going to use this new expectation, expect snapshot output. And this doesn't have like what the expected value is because it's going to save it to disk. So the first time I run this, it's going to say warning, create snapshot reference, and it creates a new file. And I forgot to put the correct directory in here. Inside the inside the test that directory is going to create a new directory called snaps underscore snaps. And inside that, it's going to have a file called foo.md, right? So our R file is called foo.r, our test file is called test-foo.r, and then our snapshot for that, the snapshot file is going to be called foo.md. So all of these are just named, have a, a strong naming convention, so you can easily find which snapshot corresponds to which test, which corresponds to which R file. So what does that snapshot contain? Well, it's a markdown file. I'll kind of explain the syntax shortly, but we use a heading to indicate that this is the test, and then it's going to put the output of that test directly in that file. So now if I run it again, if I run that test again, the test is going to work because nothing's changed, and so the test, the test will pass. If I change it to fix that typo, I run the test again, I'm getting an error saying that the previous value was something conflicted and the new value is something complicated. Now, the, the downside of snapshot tests is that there's no way to know like what is correct. So you as a human now have to step in and intervene. So if this is correct, if you really did need to make mean to make this change, you can run snapshot accept and that will accept the change. And the way that this works is that when you have this value, when something has changed, there will be a new uh, there will be a new markdown file which contains the new value. If you accept it, then it will replace that with the old value. Okay, so let's that's kind of the big picture. Um, so let's just dive into that for a slightly more realistic example. We'll start with a simple one. So I have this package. I have the same test which I copied before, and I'm going to run this test. And I'm going to run this test by pressing Command T, which is a shortcut for DevTools test file. So this keyboard shortcut takes advantage of that convention that if you've got a file called foo.r, the corresponding test will be test.foo. And so this says we've added a new snapshot. This is the value of that snapshot. I can look at it. There's this mark, markdown file again, which I'll explain shortly. And then if I run that test again, oops, if I run that test again, you'll see that all the tests have passed. The other thing, if you've used DevTools test file before, which I'll talk about briefly later, is there's now a slightly different display, a uh, slightly more compact display to hopefully make it easier to run tests for a single file interactively. So if I change this, I'm going to correct that typo. I'm going to test again. And now the test fails because a snapshot has changed. So it shows you the current value, which is something complicated, and it shows you the previous value, which is something conflicted. Now, if this was if this is a deliberate change, you can run snapshot accept. If this wasn't a deliberate change, oh, that was just a typo, I can fix it and rerun it and all my tests pass again. So if you've ever used verify output, this is a little bit different because verify output would automatically update the, the kind of true known value on, on disk, which forced you to use it with Git, basically. So I'm gonna fix this. 
the test fails, you can see now in my snaps directory, I've got foo, that's the foo.md, that's the previous value, and I've got foo.new.md, which is the new value. So I look at this, I decide that is actually correct, and then I can just copy and paste this. And now, foo.md as the correct result, and I can test that, uh, test that again. Okay, so let's look at a slightly more complicated example. So this is a bullets function, and it's basically used to create HTML bullets. So it looks like this. And this is a, like a little annoying to test because if you're going to put this in a test, you'd have to escape all of these new lines and kind of carefully manage all the white spaces. It's just a, it's just a pain. So to test this code, it's a little easy to use a snapshot test. So I can run this test. And now here is a test snapshot file with multiple expectations in it. The first one, I am just using a bullet with a single um, a single bullet, and the sec second also has a single bullet and also sets the ID. So if I later want to change this bullets function, maybe I've decided, actually, I don't want this indent. Let's get rid of that. I rerun the test. Again, the changes use Waldo to highlight what's changed. So it's a little bit hard to see this, uh, but this is the thing that's the same. It's in gray. What's changed? Well, we can see there is now uh, now no space where there was before. So I look at this. I decide, yep, that's a deliberate change. And then I run snapshot except bullets bullets to update that snapshot. And that basically is snapshot testing. Um, of course, there's more documentation. I think it'll take a little while to get your head around it all. Uh, I've shown you expect snapshot output here. There's also expect snapshot, which as well as printed output also captures messages, warnings, errors. Uh, there's also expect snapshot error if you want to capture specifically just error messages. And then we've got expect snapshot value, which captures return value. So this is a little bit different. This is um, if you, for example, wanted to test the output from like a complicated function. You just want to make sure it doesn't change without warning. You can use expect snapshot value. And then again, of course, there's the vignette, which you can look at. Well, I guess I, I can't show because I didn't. I've installed the development version of the package, which doesn't have the vignettes. But uh, you can go to the website. Actually, let's just let's just go to the website. And then we can see all these vignettes. Here's one on snapshot testing. Um, just giving you a little bit more detail about what I just talked about. So the only other thing to mention is just what are these what do these files look like? Why are they markdown files? Well, if you're writing this this if this package is a collaborative project and you're using GitHub or some other tool where you do code review, it's really important that these snapshots be human readable because when someone goes to review your code, they need to be able to look at the snapshot and say, is this a reasonable change or not? So they use markdown. Uh, the, each file again is there's one snapshot file per test file normally corresponds to our file in the R directory. There's a heading for the test name. And then if you have multiple snapshot expectations in a single test, they're separated by the horizontal roll three dashes. One thing that I'm working on at the moment, uh, and with some help from Joshua Kunst, is a Shiny app that will help you review all of these differences and accept them 
or reject them with by clicking buttons rather than typing stuff at the console. And the other big part of that is providing tools for doing image snapshots as well. So this is something that we've uh, implemented in two places in Shiny Test, which is used for testing Shiny, and VDiffer, which is used for testing ggplot2. The idea is they're going to pull out the, the common code, centralize and test that, and invest a bunch in this whole snapshotting idea. So you've got a really nice workflow if you do need to do image tests. Image tests are complicated because they can change for all sorts of reasons unrelated to your code. Um, but sometimes they're all you have, and they are a really important part of testing both Shiny itself and ggplot2 itself. Okay, so that's snapshot tests. Main idea of snapshot tests is that compared to regular unit tests, which have the expected results in the test file, snapshot tests store the expected results in another file, um, which makes them suitable for testing large output, output with quote marks and backslashes in it, and for testing things that you simply cannot describe with text like images. Next, I wanted to talk briefly about parallel tests. Uh, this is still work in progress uh, by Gabor Chadi. Uh, and again, you're going to have to activate this specifically for your package, again, by putting another line uh, in your description, config test that parallel true. But the payoff for this is pretty big. It's going to run your tests on multiple processes. So if you have uh, long running tests, this is going to make a big improvement to the total running time of your tests. Now, the, the downside is like there's a little bit of overhead associated with that starting up multiple R packages, uh, multiple R processes, loading all the code in those. Um, so there's a little bit of overhead. So if your tests are very fast, like if your tests all run in under a second, it's probably not going to have a huge impact. But if you've got tests that you know take five or 10 seconds, the whole test suite takes minutes then this should hopefully have a really big positive impact on your workflow. There are some downsides, um, as well as this big upside of speed. Tests will now kind of effectively run in stochastic order because there you'll have like four processes and each process takes kind of the next test in the queue. And so depending on exactly how long each test takes to run, like they, the tests might get run in different, a different order. And this basically means if you have any dependency between your tests, which is relatively easy to introduce because normally they will run in alphabetical order. Um, if there is any dependency between your test files, you'll get like random test failures that occur sometimes, but don't occur other times, depending on exactly which order the tests are run in. In other words, this is like a dependency debugging nightmare. Um, so we're still thinking about tools to kind of ensure that if that happens to you, we've got some mode, debugging mode you can switch on to get more insight. And then also if you've used like global setup or teardown, for example, like you set up a database or some CSV file for all of your uh, tests, you're going to need to think that through in a little bit more detail because those setup and teardown files are now run by multiple processes. So there's going to be a little bit of work to uh, convert your test to use parallel. We're still working on this. You know, there's a vignette if you want to learn more and want to try it out. Um, but we're hopeful that this will make a big impact if you've got long running tests. So I've talked about uh, this idea of the third edition. This is a special mode you'll have to switch on if you want to use all the latest and greatest test that features. Uh, We've talked about Waldo, which makes comparisons or test makes the test failures from expect equal and friends much, much easier. We talked about snapshotting tests. We talked about uh, running tests in parallel. Now I just want to show you kind of a bunch of little features that I think are kind of cool. Um, so in the course of working on test that for this release, made a bunch of improvements to the reporters. The reporters are the things that actually go and like generate. Um, the results. So when I press test, this is this is done by a reporter. If I press Command Shift T to run all of the tests, these are different reporters. Uh, one reporter that you never normally use is called Stop. You don't normally call it explicitly, but it's called Stop Reporter. That what that's what happens. Um, that's the test that's run. The, sorry, that's the reporter that's run when you run a test interactively. So here I'm just running a test. 
which is not working for probably reasons that I need to look into. But if I create a, actually I have another example over here. If I run this test, this is the stop reporter. Uh, now it clearly tells you that your test passed um, and gives you some emoji. Uh, if your test does not pass, it nicely displays the failures and it also displays any warnings and really conveniently it also displays the backtrace for the warning so if you've got warnings in any of your tests now they get a full backtrace so you can figure out exactly where that warning came from um, one of my kind of pet peeves is um let me do this is this i have i have partial matching warnings turned on and if this occurs like somewhere deep inside a function inside a function inside another function it's really hard to track down now in your test you get this nice backtrace so you can figure out exactly what function what sequence of functions leads to that problem okay so that's the stop reporter which is used in debugging so now it uses color it uses emoji and generally gives you more information about problems when you're interactively running tests I showed you earlier that compact progress reporter that is the single that is the single line here which gives you kind of a running this is a little bit low a little bit fast we could do um, slow test to expect true system. So just doing a little loop here, which is going to do an expectation and then sleep for a little bit. So you can see it like counts up, it's a little slower. So you get like a running, um, a, a running progress bar in some sense of all of the tests that are running. So you know exactly what's going on. Uh, I've made the regular reporter, which uh, you see most often when you're running all of the tests in your package. The biggest thing is um, I have added a bunch of new, of new praise um, that uses more emoji, because I think emoji are fun. Um, these random praise kind of veer into uh, a little bit into dad joke territory, but uh, hopefully they're just something, a fun little feature of test that, that uh, keeps you motivated and keeps you going when uh, your tests are working well. Uh, finally, the last reporter is the check reporter that's run inside of our command check. Now it reports all of the problems. Uh, so it also reports warnings and skips tests. It tells you all of your skips tests by type which is really useful for checking that you haven't accidentally skipped tests that you meant to run. And it also creates an RDS file with a machine readable um, list of all of the tests. That's probably not something you're gonna use directly, but it is something that we will start to build into our tooling so that things like uh, GitHub Actions can give you nicer displays of, of your tests and so on. We've also made a few changes to the way that the condition functions work. So here I have a function that calls warn and message. And now if a condition like a message, a warning or an error is not explicitly caught by your expectation, it will continue to bubble up. So if I run this line, oops, and I spell this correctly. If I run this line, this expectation passes, it does find a warning called high, but the message called by still bubbles up. Or if I say I expect a message called by, I'll see a warning called high. So if I wanna capture both of them, I need to use expect message and expect warning together. This hopefully will give you better control over exactly what's going on. It's gonna cause a few more warnings in your tests. Uh, these won't cause your package to fail our commands check, but they will require a little bit of work to make sure that those tests are as you expect. Um, if you want to get, just ignore them, you can still, rather than using expectations, you can just switch to the base functions 
suppress messages and suppress warnings if you don't care about them. Now, you might notice here that we've got expectations nested inside of expectations, and you might kind of naturally think, well, why can't I use the pipe for that? Uh, unfortunately, you cannot currently do that because the pipe eagerly evaluates everything. Um, so if I do this, you get uh, a buy and a high, and then this fails because this is called before this is called. Uh, we will start to announce a new work in Magruder that will make this work uh, and hopefully make Magruder um, a little more compatible with uh, the native pipe that is likely to appear in the next version of R as well. Okay, so that, and that also means if you, one of the, I don't know, 10 people in the world who use the all argument, so expect warning, expect message, that's now deprecated. You have to take a slightly different approach, but I'm pretty confident that's gonna be a, it's a much nicer API overall uh, and should not change any existing, shouldn't change existing behavior too much. And the last thing is if you've ever used expect error and it gives you this message to set the class, uh, we no longer encourages you to do that. It kind of fixed one type of test fragility, basically the cost of increasing, just introducing a different type of fragility. Uh, and so now you're better off just using expect snapshot error if you want to check that a specific error occurs, um, because that just gives you a bunch of nice features for, for managing the change over time. Okay, so uh, just about to wrap up, which is great. So there's plenty of time for questions. Uh, so what have I talked about today? First, uh, test that 3.0 is coming out soon. I should say we'll probably start the release process in about a month, which means it's at least two months before it's on CRAN. Uh, so I, it would really be great if you would try it out. And this is the right time to let us know if this is causing you pain so we can fix it before release. Uh, plenty of time to do that. Uh, so the third edition, is going to be part of test that 3.0, which will be on CRAN and at least, well, the soonest possible is probably two months. It's likely to be a little longer than that. The third edition, you will have to deliberately opt into. That gives you a bunch of new features at the cost of doing a little bit of work to clean up um, old APIs. Uh, the new edition uses Waldo to make comparisons, which will hopefully make your test failures much easier to debug. It provides snapshot tests, which are an alternative form of testing where the expected results are stored on separate files rather than inline and code. And then the test that provides some functions to help manage those files so that you can accept changes when you have made them deliberately or revert changes when you've made them accidentally. Test that 3.0 will also introduce parallel testing, um, which again will be a little bit of setup work just to make sure your uh, global setup and teardown works appropriately and you haven't don't accidentally have any uh, dependencies between your tests but the payoff will be if you have slow tests they should run much much faster because they'll run in parallel and then finally i showed you a bunch of goodies many of them featuring a emoji that will hopefully make your day-to-day -day life using test that a little bit more fun a little bit more pleasant so if you do want to try it out today, you'll need to get the development version of TestThat and the development version of DevTools. Um, and then in your um, in your package, if this is a package on uh, that uses continuous integration or similar, you'll need to add TestThat to remotes. And you'll need to accept the addition to the third edition to take advantage of all the latest and greatest features. So that was a lot of content in 40 minutes. Again, hopefully, uh, if you didn't take in everything I was saying, uh, there's plenty of additional material in all of the vignettes. And if you don't find those understandable, please let me know so we can make them better. Thank you. And now, hopefully, Jenny will have some questions for me. Yeah. So the first big one is I think people want to hear more about why you're doing a third edition. So why not create an entirely new package the same way that PlyR led to dplyR, or why not create test that three? 
Or why can you not do this through semantic versioning of the existing package? Okay, so let's, the first question is like, why, why not a new package? And that was something I considered, but like 90% of the code between the second edition and the third edition are the same. Like the biggest difference with the third edition is it just takes stuff away from you, stuff that we now regret. So if we created a new package, we'd have two packages that have like 90% overlap in their code. And whenever there was a bug, we'd have to remember to fix it in, in both packages. So I think for this case, we are like most of the stuff is the same. We're just trying to get rid of um, some new things. Uh, I, I think creating a new package would be, would be overkill. Um, the question about semantic versioning is something that like test that does use semantic versioning. This is a major version will be test at 3.0, but that actually that doesn't really help um, in the R community because you only have a single version of a package installed on your computer and when, in a library, you can kind of work around that, but it's a little fiddly. And for packages on CRAN, they always use the latest version of the package on CRAN. So if I just released test that 3.0 with all of these new features in it, like something like 500 packages would break on CRAN because they would automatically use the version of test that on CRAN. So I think that that's why those are like, we, we want to make a little bit of friction so that you have to deliberately choose to use this new testing, use, use these new conventions, use this, basically stop using old stuff that you should have stopped using a while ago. Um, without duplicating a bunch of code that we then have to maintain in, in two places. Okay, so now I have a series of questions and the list is growing longer that are smaller and we'll just work through as many as we can. So this first one is, have you tested whether snapshotting plays nice with things like cover or the good practice package? Does this third edition work have any effect on shiny test? So kind of talking about how this works with other packages. Yeah, so cover, I mean, snapshot testing is just testing. It just works exactly the way you'd expect with cover. Uh, I don't know that much about good practice. I would, I would think it would not intersect. I don't think it would cause problems for, for good practice. Um, shiny test, it's not clear precisely how this will play out. Um, I've been having kind of bigger discussions with the Shiny team about how testing Shiny should work um, because my vision for testing Shiny is quite different from their vision of testing Shiny apps. And so we're just working towards that. I, I think in an ideal world, eventually Shiny test would use kind of more of this new, this new snapshotting infrastructure that um, test that provides but there's some other big changes that have to happen to shiny test so i you know it's, it's hard to say today whether that shiny test will eventually kind of integrate this better or um, there will be a new package that's kind of a successor to shiny test um, that used you know uses some other stuff and is more focused on snapshot testing via test that uh, if you want to kind of see my take on um, testing shiny i'm working on this chapter at the moment uh if you follow the shiny test repo you'll notice that i've recently recently uh triaged like a hundred and something issues so i'm like thinking about this a lot i'm starting to work on it uh thinking about the test i don't exactly know what the answer is but um you can kind of see my latest thinking in this package in this in this chapter of mastering shiny which will get updated you know pretty pretty rapidly in the next week or two. All right, the next one is, do test snapshots need to be included in the package or could you exclude them if they're large and then developers can recreate them from a stable version? Uh, I, th I think you, if you want people to be able to run your tests, you have to include them in your package. Um, because they are literally like the correct, out the correct output. Um, one thing I did forget to mention is that snapshot tests are not run, will be skipped on CRAN automatically. You can opt out of that with an argument if you want. Just because if, if a snapshot test fails, it isn't necessarily 
true that it's like a real meaningful failure. It might be an incidental difference or a difference from a downstream package that you don't want to cause a failure on CRAN. Um, but yes, if you want people to run your test, you have to include the correct, you have to include the expected result in the package. All right, is it possible to use snapshot tests if the function does not return anything, but rather has a side effect? Uh, so I mentioned briefly uh, expect snapshot, which captures the side effects of messages, warnings, and errors. Uh, if it's making other changes to the global state, you would need to make that kind of explicit, you know, like if it's attaching, if your function attaches a package, you know, you might do expect snapshots, uh, like search, which would capture the, the, the search path. Or maybe if it's creating files in the directory, you could use um, yeah, so it doesn't um, directly handle side effects apart from messages, warnings, and errors, but you could easily wrap up a you know a little function that, that captures those side effects and makes them explicit and snapshot that. All right, the next person missed a little bit about what's going on with context, but but sees that it's deprecated and thinks that it's needed when using the J unit reporter. So how is how are those two things going to work out? Uh, I don't. So let me just find a. Let me see if I can quickly find a package just so I can explain the context for this change to context a little more. Okay, so this is just the per package. I just searched to find all the uses of context, and you can see like the test dash lmap dot r file contains a called a context lmap. The test as dash mapper dot r called as it contains a called a context as underscore mapper, which is a little mildly inconsistent. Or test dash when contains a called a context when. Test dash utils contains a called a context utils. So by and large, it's like a one-to-one -one mapping between what you put in the context and the name of the file. And that is just um, like you know, you don't want that duplication because you end up with inconsistencies. Or maybe if I can find, oh, here we you can see that this this is a test for PMAP. It probably used to be test dash PMAP, but we renamed the file and forgot to update the test context. And so now there's like this mismatch between the two. So that's the reason why we're getting rid of context because it's just it just introduces this duplication for for the real games. Um, but the context is still kind of implicit, like we just take the file name, so the context that test that the JUnit reporter, for example, will use will just be map underscore n. So it shouldn't change anything uh, practically with um, the JUnit reporter. Okay, so this is a person like me who uses with mock and local mock. So if they're going to be deprecated, what is the suggested way to mock functions in external packages. I read that the goal of Mocker, the package Mocker, is to provide a drop-in replacement, but it does not have this feature. So basically, um, the way that with Mock works um, is truly an abuse of R. Um, and it does something that I now believe to be tremendously ill-advised and the chances of it stopping working in a future version of R are high because what it, do, it does is so uh, bizarre and horrific. Um, so basically you have to use an, you have to use another approach. So both um, the mockr and mockery packages provide slightly different techniques. Unfortunately, you just have to you have to use those. Um, I'm just so concerned that the way that with mock works is is not it's not good, and it's surprising that it hasn't caused any problems to date. So I just yeah, unfortunately, it's like something that is really nice and really useful, but was achieved in a really really horrible way. Um, does snapshot have a limit on the size of the data 
and can you combine snapshot tests with more explicit tests of the snapshot? Uh, yeah, so that was kind of, so there's no limit on the size. Um, and I think, you know, generally, you know, you'll, you'll, you will sort of mingle snapshot testing with regular testing, like where you can, like if this is a list, you know, you might want to test that this is a specific value. And there's another component of the, the list that's just a, you know, a big blob that you don't want to kind of type out. So I would imagine, you know, I really imagine that you will want to mingle those as much as possible. Um, I, I think it will be tempting um, to overuse snapshot testing just because it's so convenient because you have to write like the right hand side of expect equal. You have to you have to make clear in your head exactly what you're expecting. Uh, but I think if you do that, if you if you use snapshotting too much, you'll find your tests are a little bit fragile and kind of break uh, more often than you otherwise uh, like, and that will kind of push you naturally back towards the finer grained unit testing that you're that you're used to and test that. Uh, you know, of course, putting really large files in your package is going to be annoying for other reasons. Um, so I don't, I don't think you want to put like you know megabytes of of data using this, but certainly like kilobytes of data, which would be a pain to put in a, a test file. It's a really nice sweet spot for snapshot testing. Okay, uh, I have two questions that are a little bit of emoji pushback. Uh, not to be a killjoy, but praise seems unnecessary. Why not include it as a suggested package? And then also, is there a way to suppress emojis for build pipelines that may not support them? Uh, so so some people really, I don't know. So first of all, it doesn't use the praise package. It just uses its own. Well, I guess it does. Is that right? Let me refresh my memory. I guess it does use the praise package, which is a tiny package. So uh, I guess we could make this a suggested package, but it just seems like, I don't know. If someone did a pull request that made praise into a suggested package rather than a dependent package, I'd consider it, but just doesn't, I don't think it practically really reduces the cost of installing test that in any practical way. Uh, if you don't want emojis, you can just turn or you can't turn the emojis off, although they will be automatically turned off if you're not in a UTA 8 locale, which is normally on uh, Windows. Uh, but you can uh, test report. Uh, uh, if I remember what, what's it called, progress reporter. If you really don't like them, you can turn them off by. Um, calling setting stuff up in a special way and saying show praise equals false but the praise only shows up in reporters that are used interactively it never shows up in um in reporters that are used in r command check or in other continuous integration contexts so i think it's like it's to me it's purely it's just a fun thing um i don't think there's anything wrong with introducing a little a little fun and joy into unit testing and you know, by and large, people really like it. But if you don't, you can turn it off. Okay, I've been using a Waldo a bit. Is there any planned way to control the amount of output that is shown? Um, yes. Um, so someone actually just did a pull request for Waldo so that you can choose to print any number of changes. Uh, by default, Waldo doesn't show, it shows like 10 changes with a kind of assumption that if um, you have more than 10 changes, you probably want to start by fixing the first 10 changes uh, and that will reveal more, more issues. Um, I think this is something I, this is just purely um, driven by pragmatics, you don't want failures that generate hundreds of lines of output when the one when there's like something horrifically wrong in the first line that you, that is actionable. Um, so I, I I don't have a good sense of what like where where that slider should be set by default and how you should slide it to more or less output um, yet. But you know that's something that we'll keep thinking about and iterating on as we as we work on this in in reality in our packages. All right, I've I've picked two last questions. One is super tiny, and then one's a little bit bigger and makes a good conclusion. 
So the tiny off topic question is, how do you get the Git branch into your prompt in the R console? Oh, yeah, so if you're wondering what this this thing was, uh, this is the, the the name of my active Git branch, and that is some code in my R profile that uses uh, Gabor's prompt package to just put the Git branch, and then this automatically updates um, whenever you run any R code, so it automatically stays up to date as you change the branch. Okay, so the last question, I think it's a good one to close on, is to think about like what's the long-term game plan with this addition idea. So this person's like, for now, in the dev version, after I install it, I have to change uh, this config entry in description. Yep. Will this still be the case indefinitely when it's not the dev version, but it's the released version, or at some point will it default to edition three and someone might have to opt in to version edition two. I don't see any way to change the default edition from two without breaking hundreds of CRAN packages. So I think that implies that the default version will always be two. But what we will do in the tools that we use for creating packages, like in use this, we will automatically set the config to kind of the, the latest version. So when you start, the kind of the idea is that when you start a new package you get the latest of you get the latest edition of test that when you are working on an old package you have to deliberately opt into the new version if you really want it and i think that kind of offers the, the best compromise of packages that are actively developed can easily upgrade without touching anything that's that's not being developed thanks for thanks for joining us and uh learning about the upcoming third edition of test that Again, like now is the perfect time to give feedback on things you like, things that you hate. Uh, we're listening and we really appreciate, appreciate your feedback.